Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Tlolo from Future Nation Schools, and I just actually thank you for joining us for the first in our Future Talk webinar series hosted by Future Nation School. Uh, Future Nation Schools is a network of independent schools that aims to lead the African education revolution by providing a model that is futuristic, technology enabled, and epitomizes excellence. The idea behind our Future Talk series is to share ideas and have conversations around the Africa of the future and how we can shape it together. And I'd just like to thank you for honoring that invite. Over to our co-founder and CEO, Mr. Sizung Hassan. Thanks very much, Tulu, and uh, welcome again, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us and spending your time this evening uh, to be with us. We have a number of challenges that we face in the basic education space. Uh, so this discussion here today about Africanizing and decolonizing the curriculum is a real issue. Uh, we saw students as part of the hashtag fees must fall uh, some four years ago, raise the issue of Africanizing or decolonizing our education. There were some you know, efforts and maybe activities that happened at the time, but things seem to have just gone back to normal. In other words, the progress that we're beginning to make in this regard as a country uh, has stalled and has actually gone backwards. So it is important to have these discussions. So uh, thanks very much for joining us. There'll be other webinar series that we'll be doing as Future Talk. And uh, please, uh, you know, keep tuned in. Uh, thanks very much. Over to you, uh, Tulu. Thank you very much. Um, and so this evening's topic as spoken about by Bamin Asana is decolonizing and Africanizing the school curriculum. And this will be presented by Professor Vuisile Msila. Now, just a bit of background about our speaker for this evening. Vuisile Msila is the former head of the University of South Africa's Research Institute for African Renaissance Studies. His expertise is in education leadership, curriculum, and teaching, as well as the politics of education in general. His research is also in Africanization and decolonization of education. He's now attached to the newly established Tawambeki School of Public and International Affairs at UNISA, where he's a professor and researcher. His recent academic books published include Ubuntu, Shaping the Current Workplace with African Wisdom, Africanizing the Curriculum, Developing Teaching and Learning in Africa, Decolonizing Perspectives. He has published various journals and books. His two upcoming books in 2021 are An Introduction to an Afro-Conscious Curriculum, Possibilities and Realities of Decolonization, as well as Reading Bigo, Critical and Reflective Essays. Professor Msila is also a regular newspaper columnist in the independent newspapers. Good evening to you and welcome, Professor. Good evening. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to have you, Professor. Um, without any further ado, we can go straight into your presentation for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would like to thank the CEO of Future Nation Schools, as well as his colleagues who have made this possible. It is really a pleasure for me to come and learn here this evening with many other colleagues who have joined us. It is, it is, it is quite an honor also to share my ideas and, and listen to my colleagues discussing these very important issues. So thank you very much. You know, what we are talking about today um, is, is very important, but when you look at what we are talking about this is a topic where you'll find that a fatigue is creeping in because people find that they are saying that we've been discussing these issues for a long, long time. You know, I even have a friend who last year when he was chatting to me, he said, no, man, there's nothing that can be changed here. I mean, we've been discussing these issues from uh, as back as 1980, you know, I, it, he made me re, 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 remember what a friend of mine, Jovu Gajeni, told me, saying that sometimes when a child asks for a fish today, we cannot be surprised if again tomorrow they ask for the same fish until they get it. 
So that is why it is very critical that people should continue the struggle for the emancipation, for, for, for the liberation of education. It is very, very critical that we should look at these debates and see what can be done, especially moving from theory to practice. So I will be talking about these. I'll be reading a bit from my notes um, as well as of course talk off end because I do not have much time. So thank you again, ladies and gentlemen. Um, the battle for transforming schools and all basic education institutions in South Africa has been a struggle to transform a long legacy that emanates from mission and apartheid schools. This is a struggle to Africanize, to decolonize, to indigenize, thus entrenching a new soul of the school. That is the identity, the new identity that we want our schools to have. And it all refers to a new face of schools, a face that refuses to look down upon the embracing of relevant identities. As I lead this discussion on this topic, I want us to think clearly of three distinct but interrelated terms which form the basis of our discussion this evening. And just before I go in there, for, for, for a long time, we were very much boggled down to, to, to terms, because whenever we would be discussing, people would be saying, let's discuss terms. What do we mean? That is very important. But I feel that there was a time where one felt that now this is dragging. We are not getting into, into issues. OK, the three, the three terms, Africanization, decolonization, and indigenization, quickly, Africanization refers to the unapologetic claim and embrace of being African to Africans of former colonies or those who lived under oppression. This means extolling the African and respecting culture and identity of Africans. So here we set the rules, very, very important. And then the second one is decolonization. Is the, this is the advanced stage of self-knowledge and self-determination as Africans. In education, when we decolonize, we bring the marginalized cultures and identities to the center, very critical. Decolonization is also a realization that Europe is a mere province and that all knowledge is meta and not Western knowledges only. When we speak of the center of knowledge, it needs to include all knowledges. So decolonization in short, it has it talks about removing the colonial elements, especially those that are, that are damaging. Indigenization. Indigenizing refers to the realization that knowledge should reflect the aspirations and influences of the local or people native to that part of the world. Indigenizing like, like decolonization are, are an antidote to colonialism. Indigenizing helps bring marginalized world views. This means that it's adding or including uh, marginalized knowledges. These concepts collectively are supposed to help us answer some of the perplexing questions as we negotiate our ways in understanding the transformation of education. Some of the questions that people normally ask include the following. Does the curriculum reflect African ways? Does it address social justice issues such as human, humanization? Is this culture sensitive? Is it liberatory? Is it inclusive? These are just some of them. Of course, there are many questions that we ask from, from, from time to time. Remember education, we're all concerned about it because we believe that it sets our future. You know, when we get it right, we are hopeful that our future will also be right. And some have also underscored the following as critical when we transform education for schools. Diversification of materials, teaching content that liberates and support social justice, utilizing assessments that ensure that diverse learners show, show achievement in diverse ways. All these three are critical 
are critical uh, uh, concepts as we try to find our way, trying to explore what we need to do as we are trying to, to change our education system around as we redress the past uh, education system, which did not serve the Africans uh, the, the, the way they should be served. So we need that in, in schools in, in Freire language to schools that conscientize and impress upon dialogue and are relevant to society's aspirations. And in this presentation, I actually touch four topics. The first one is the Afro, Afro conscious curriculum. This is just an excerpt, a bit I've taken from my upcoming book, as you heard earlier. Um, I've, I've taken a bit from, from that book to explain um, what, what, we, what we mean by that. The next one is using multiplicity of knowledges. Sometimes we refer to this as ecologies of knowledge because sometimes people would be saying that when you are talking about decolonization and Africanization, it means you, 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 you sort of marginalized Western knowledges. It is not like that. Hence, we'll be talking a bit about the ecologies of knowledge. The next one is rethinking thinking, very critical when we are talking about this debate. How do you really think about thinking? How do you look at education and say, this year I need to rethink, this year I need to rethink thinking itself. And then of course, the, the, the next one is cognitive justice. How do we move from theory to, to, to practice? Sometimes people would be saying that, but you guys do not really come with practice. What are we supposed to do? You are always talking about theory. So that is why I'll be talking a bit about, about that as well. How do we achieve the cognitive justice that we talk, we're talking about? So this, this, is, this is also very critical. So my, my presentation, will follow these four topics. Um, how do we, when I talk about Afro-conscious Afro curriculum, I talk about ways in which our education system can be able to coexist in a global world whilst coming from a very strong uh, position. You know, we'll be coming with the knowledge, indigenous knowledges, that we bring from, from, from the continent before we can be, and mastering it before coming into contact with the global world. The curriculum should be transforming and be prepared for a culturally diverse society. As we know that our society is very diverse. So the, the, what, when, when we are formulating our curricula, we should be able to look at it and ensure that it serves our culturally diverse society. And it, this reminds me of Eskiam Patele. You know, I think Eskiam Patele, Professor Patele was far ahead of his times because as early as 1977, he drew a, a curriculum for the Funda Center. I'm not sure whether Funda Center is still, is still on its feet today, but what it drew there to show how an integrative uh, curriculum can be used to promote this South Africanness, you know, bringing consciousness to learners and bringing also a relevant and responsive curriculum. So it was very critical. And when I'm, whenever I'm reading him, I find it very uh, 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 important when we are looking at today's debates, because the our 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 success will really depend upon being able to integrate the various aspects of our curricula. So it needs to unpack colonialism and apartheid. It needs to build this new South Africanness we are talking about. And it should be, it should bring also consciousness, which is important as intellectualism. So all these 
are very important as we are looking at this. You'll find that if we look at the 1960s, at the new African states um, around the continent, all of them in some way, they were trying to bring in what we are talking about today. You know, not all of them became successful, of course. Um, there were many problems. For instance, take uh, Nyerere, uh, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania. In fact, he was one of the most vocal ones of all these leaders. But when he tried to bring this ujama, which, is, uh, which meant that bringing everybody together, community together to form this African education that would really rely on self-reliance where everybody in Tanzania will be self-reliant. After some time, it failed because of several reasons that were not of his making. One of them, the sponsors decided to move back um, and, and secondly, Julius Nyerere, he was alone in really guiding this program in his country. Otherwise, there was nothing wrong with what uh, uh, Tanzania was trying to do under Nyerere. Same thing in, 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 in Nigeria. In Nigeria, you know, when you look at the work of Babs Fafunwa, Professor Fafunwa, he was leading in bringing an African-centered curriculum. And as a minister of education, he produced a number of publications to show what do we need? What does Nigeria need to ensure that education is relevant? Education is responsive to the needs of the Nigerians. And uh, of course, if you go to Zambia, same thing. That's what Kenneth Kaunda was trying to do, you know, using humanism to try and change the education system, you know, from colonial system to, 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 to a new African-centered uh, education. And of course, most of them didn't really achieve what they wanted to achieve for several reasons. But if you look at their vision, they had this vision of changing around, ensuring that learners in Africa needs to be positive and know exactly what they need to do to change their countries around. And if you look at all of them, the debates that we have in South Africa today are debates that they also started years ago. They talk about language, the importance of indigenous language, you know, and how education needs to use uh, 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 indigenous languages, very important. And this is a debate that is, that is very much vibrant in our country today. Only five days ago, we heard in Stellenbosch University, the, 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 the debate on English versus Africans coming up again. So all these are, are critical uh, debates that we can never really um, ignore. And they've been there for many years. And these leaders I'm talking about have tried several ways to solve these problems that their countries were, 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 were encountering. For instance, if you look at Zambia, they have their own points as what they wanted to achieve in education. One is Lifelong learning, learning that does not only take place in classrooms, very critical again, that education should not only end in the classroom, it should continue beyond the classroom. You know, equity and equality, that is what we are striving for in South Africa today. We still are talking about the goals of education, that education should really achieve equity and equality and all individuals should benefit from education. We know how Bantu education was. We know generally how apartheid education, uh, what, what it did to us in terms of ensuring that we had an unequal society and there was no equity of, or at all. The national concerns, various societal concerns considered in education, you know, in Zambia, language of instruction, the use of Zambian indigenous languages recognized in preschool and early grades. Uh, here, 
maybe later, you will also see how this is a, a deep problem that as South Africans, we as Africans, in fact, in general, around the continent, we need to look into. And then curriculum localization, curriculum that is responsive to learners and social needs, you know, rather than really not looking at what is around the learners. It is very important that we should look at what is what is relevant? What do the learners see outside? You know, again, giving you an example, last month I was in the, in the former Transkai, you know, the rural villages there, in, uh, 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 talking to school principals, trying to get how they were coping with the learning during the time of COVID. You know, what one principal said, you know, um, was implanted in me because he said, our curriculum, we do not really look that we are teaching rural children. We teach what the learners in, in, in townships in the city are taught in such a way that these children, whenever they find chance, they leave the rural area because we are preparing them for the city. That is just an example. That is just a small example. Coming back to this bigger picture, we do not want a curriculum that does not address, that is not responsive to the surroundings, to the environment of our learners. It, they should see education, what it means in their surroundings. Uh, that is very critical. The next one is ecologies of knowledge, the multiplicity of knowledges. As we search for epistemic freedom, it is important that learners should be aware of the diversity. Long should, we should forget about the past where Western knowledges dominated and indigenous knowledges were relegated to the back. What we need now is also to bring the indigenous knowledges to the center. Take the best from the Western knowledges, take the best from indigenous knowledges and combine those to have uh, this, these ecologies of knowledge that we are talking about so as to grow our learners, to make sure we build them to be what we want them to be. And this is a very good way of fighting epistemic violence, of opposing epistemic violence. Because we cannot just say, now is the time to marginalize the Western knowledges. What, what, what we need to do when we are Africanizing and decolonizing, um, we need to ensure that the, 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 the learners are able to use as much knowledge as possible, as much, especially knowledge that is relevant to, what, to where they are, to what they are doing, to what they want to be in future. It should lead to this epistemic justice that we are talking about, because we know they come from a past where there was this epistemic violence that ensured that they do not, they do not really look deep into their indigenous knowledges. That is why people like Ngugi Thiongo talks about, there's a term that he uses, it's called globalectics. What could we mean by this term globalectics is that we should see interconnectedness when it comes to knowledge. Because if we see this interconnectedness, then we would be able to enrich our learners. So global is, is really about that, is to see this interconnectedness rather than say, because we are Africanizing, because we are decolonizing, we don't want to have anything to do with that particular knowledge. No, here we are looking at this diversity, as I've said, to take taking the best from the, from the Western knowledges and taking the best from, from indigenous knowledges and making these the the, the, the kind of knowledge that we want for our, our schools, for our learners. So taking the best from the global South and mm, combining it with what we have in the global North. Um, very important because when we do that, it will be, you know, show that this strong real, realization that we need to reflect Western ideas 
and, 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 and the indigenous world views. Without doing this, then we would be really be not be enriching the knowledge base of our learners. Ali Mazrui argues that knowledge is critical and that Africa's poverty emanates from a weak knowledge base. Furthermore, Masrui argues that it matters how people are predisposed epistemologically. Hence, leaders with the necessary knowledge will be able to consciously lead successful institutions. The institutions today are about thinking and rethinking relevant strategies since the advent of decolonization in educational institutions, such as school, people have talked about rethinking of organizations that are presupposed to decenter exclusive Eurocentric values as they bring marginalized African values to the center to create this ecology of knowledges that we are talking about. And again, Gugi talks about moving the center that let us move the center from where it has always been and emphasize the cultural freedoms and social and push for social change, uh, which implies liberating the restrictions imposed upon world cultures by imperialism. Furthermore, moving the center is about a quest for social justice in society demonized by epistemic violence and marginalization of African values. Uh, colonization had always had this negative impact. You know, um, talking about colonial education and, and apartheid education, um, I.B. Tabata, Isaac Bangani Tabata, you know, the, who was um, uh, uh, an academic, once wrote about, once wrote a book, uh, which is Education for Barbarism where he was showing how apartheid education was really uh, pushing indigenous knowledges to the margins. Hence, he said that we need to really rethink the idea of schools. Talking about rethinking, let me look at it closely now. Transforming our schools and engendering new schools with a new identity, we need to rethink thinking schools for the future. A paradigm shift is necessary as we establish schools that are not like apartheid and colonial schooling systems. Research should focus on learners, teachers, and the curricula. As we do this, we cannot eschew critical thinking, which is pivotal factor when we talk about changing schools or transforming schools. Rethinking thinking schools, rethinking thinking and schools ensures that we envisage schools with a new soul, the new identity that I talked about earlier and the role of teachers as purveyors of knowledge changes making them to be transformative intellectuals rather than purveyors of knowledge. They use knowledge to change their world and be in dialogue with their world. Rethinking thinking means reconceptualizing pedagogy as we know it and as we know it and think of teaching and learning as a conduit of social justice and humanization. Education should embrace education that would produce thinkers, education that would prepare learners for the future rather than the past. Most importantly, education should be a democratic liberating act, you know, in the Freirean sense. You know, Paolo Freire all, always talked about this, that we should move away from education that oppresses. That is why when you talk about Africanizing education and decolonizing education, talking about these, the issues of, of, of social justice, we, we want us to move away from education that is oppressive and bring in liberating education that really does not alienate. Because um, um, education tends to alienate when it is not relevant to what the learners are doing. Education needs to, to really think of 
it, it should address one culture sites, which is the killing of cultures. We know colonialism, what it did, killed the cultures. So that is the first thing. When we rethink thinking, when we rethink education itself, we need to address that culture sites. The next one is epistemicides, which is the killing of knowledge. So again, as we rethink education, as we rethink thinking itself, we need to look how do we revive the, 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 the knowledges that were killed uh, during the, the advent of colonialism. The next one is historicides, the killing of history. How do we ensure that we bring that back, that history, the positive history that we should be talking about? And of course, the last one is linguicides. You know, many debates around the language issue because languages were also killed by, by colonization. Hence, it is important as we are thinking of, uh, as we are rethinking thinking and trying to transform schools, we need to ensure that we're able to look at, 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 at the idea of language. And schools that do not address these in Africa are failing another generation of learners. Addressing these is, uh, is an antidote to colonial and apartheid education. Rethinking is the foundation of establishing new schools. And then here I talk about uh, a, a changing teacher practice. As we rethink thinking, we should also look at how do we change teacher practice? You know, we, we, we know those of, 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 of us who are teachers that what we usually do as teachers, we teach the way we were taught. But now as we try to rethink education, as we are trying to come with this new thinking, we want teachers, we want people who work with learners to be able to unthink that thinking, to unthink some of the inherited ideas, you know, the theories and concept. That is why it is important that when we are talking about this changing, this transforming schools, we should not leave teaching behind. You know, the idea of teachers as, as continuous learners, very critical here that they should always learn. Otherwise, this project would fail like all other projects. And teachers should also get used to making learners co-curriculum creators. So the, the, the Friere again uses the term dialogic. So teachers should be able to use, to, to, to be in dialogic classrooms, classrooms that are inviting, where the learners are not seen as tabula rasas. rasas. We know how uh, the, the, the apartheid education regarded uh, learners as, as blank slates. And the teachers in classrooms, they just had to cast the knowledge on these blank slates. And uh, the learners were there just to listen to teachers. But now when we're talking about this transformation, we're talking, we're seeing learners as co-creators of knowledge because they bring a lot to classrooms. They are also intellectuals that can, together with teachers, transform the, 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 the classroom. And magnifying the role, uh, Africa's role in marginalized epistemologies. When we rethink, we need to think of that. Rethinking education means bringing Africa's knowledges to the center and be equal to other knowledges. Very important, again, a point I've been laboring on. And then the last one is empowering all role players. Sometimes we tend to leave other important role players. Parents, for instance, you know, in the, in the, in the study I just completed and was talking about in the rural uh, uh, villages in the Eastern Cape, one of the things I found is that even when they are not, they have not been through formal education parents can play a huge role in motivating their children. So it is very critical that the communities, the parents 
and many other role players that can be found in the, in the society, they should be part of the strategizing of saying, this is where we want to go. This is how education should be. So this is very important. Um, the role of parents is, is immense and we have found it in various studies, how the involvement of parents can change what is happening in these classrooms. Um, this, this makes us to look at education, to look at learners themselves in different ways when we, when we re really rethink of what is happening in, in classrooms. Rethinking thinking is fundamentally a decolonial move that requires the cultivation of a decolonial attitude in knowledge production. It is informed by a strong conviction that all human beings are not only born into a knowledge system, but are legitimate knowers and producers of legitimate knowledge. Rethinking thinking is also a painstaking decolonial process of learning to unlearn in order to relearn. That is Kovukachin. Eurocentric and apartheid education have necessitated the teacher education and schools to constantly and consciously address the miseducation and dehumanization aspects of education in the past as well as in the present. Thomas Seitz Masrui, who contends that African and third world people ought to be co-workers in the revival of education and culture. The idea of parents that I talked about, that we need everybody to be part of what, especially when we are looking at indigenous knowledges, it cannot be done when not everybody is not involved. So that is why it is very critical that we need all these, uh, 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 as stakeholders, all these role players to be part of the change that we want to achieve in, 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 in the schools. The current COVID pandemic has made many societies rethink education and rethink thinking on the basic education in the basic education institutions. We have also found through this pandemic that we need technology to build critical thinking, creativity and communication. This takes us to cognitive justice and education redress. In rethinking, thinking and, trans and transforming education for future Africa, we need to think, to, to, to think of integrated education to, to, to ensure that we have the kind of a model that Mpathele um, introduced, you know, to integrate the different kinds of, 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 of learning areas uh, uh, and how we do things in classroom and so on. All these, uh, I, I'm trying to rush, I, I, I see that I've gone over, over the given time. Um, for, because Mpathele drafted the rules that envisage the curricula and, and, and of course looked at the relevance and he looked at how, how education should address how, how things are and in, in the way that they are not and, 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 and how, how we develop the consciousness of the, of the learners. For instance, if you look at his curriculum Pasele, in Funda Center, he had things like know your country, know your continent Africa, know your environment, black consciousness, know your civics, growing up in South Africa, the accent of men. So all these, they become part of his integrated a curriculum to, to, to try and build learners for the future. From the ecologies of knowledge professed by many, decolonial scholars, we can formulate curricula that is fecund and redresses history and emboldens Africa, decentering the empire in the process. The curricula needs to move the center in the Gugi Wationgo sense, you know, when Gugi talks about moving the center, you know, starting with decolonizing the mind. For instance, it is Gugi again who says that we should start with our languages, addressing linguicides. Gugi says, for example, if, 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 if our children know all the languages, 
of the world and do not know their own mother tongue, they, that, that, that is enslavement. But if they know the mother tongue and add all language, other languages, that is empowerment. So the, the, the problem here is that we should start. This is the same idea that uh, Chanda Adha Diop, you know, uh, profess. He said that uh, our African Renaissance that we, what we've always been talking about cannot be achieved without looking closely at the languages and ensuring that the indigenous languages become part of the rethinking process. They become part of the change. So that is what Ngugi is also here echoing. And he says that teaching in indigenous languages inculcates an attitude, a necessary attitude that says knowledge does not only come from outside, you know, because the, 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 the learners get the sense that if we always teach them only exclusively in French or English, they tend to believe that their indigenous knowledges cannot carry knowledge. So uh, knowledge is only, can only be found in other languages, in Western uh, languages, not their own. Starting with the mother tongue builds confidence in learners. And it is from this confidence that they can become whoever they want to be. What Young also points out that decolonizing the minds start here. So this idea about languages and ensuring that they, 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 they are brought into the space of transforming education and ensuring that we, we use them as a vehicle for change. But teachers cannot be left behind here as in most cases, they do not know how to succeed in integrating indigenous knowledges in school curriculum. Teachers need to think of suitable teaching methods. In studying history, for example, it would help immensely if classrooms would invite or go to the elders in communities. Classrooms need to change how they see knowledge. This is very critical. Stokes, for example, urges that teacher education needs to be consistent with the progressive democratic vision and that teachers should ensure that in their classrooms, they constantly examine their cultural identities as they enhance critical consciousness among learners. Decolonizing teacher education is an imperative step towards the attainment of the objectives of a, colonized, of a decolonized system of education. This should be part of the rethinking process, rethinking the curriculum and ensuring that it will be meaningful to the lives of all learners in their classrooms. If you go back to 1998, when uh, it was tough times for people like Professor Bengu and Professor Asma, trying to bring in the new system of education post-apartheid. They started with the outcomes-based education. If you look there, the, 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 the gripe from many people was that teachers did not know what to do. And OBE was found to, 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 to be de-skilling to many teachers. They didn't know how to move. So, that is why we do not want to get there when we are talking about uh, transforming education. But I'm happy to see the various programs around the country where teachers are part of the process of changing the curriculum. But we need more of these because you'll find that some schools, some institutions do this more than other institutions. It is very critical that teachers should not be left behind because these are the people who will really interpret the curriculum in classrooms. So if they do not know how to move, it's, it's, it will be a disaster. That is why it is important that they must be part of this. You know, some people have said that we must also think about, about, about indigenizing mathematics, indigenizing science, and all these become crucial when we are talking about this cognitive justice and trying to move from theory to practice, you know, using what many learners have at their disposal, ensuring that they are able to apply the knowledge that they get from outside and, and when they get into their classrooms. In conclusion, we need to continuously fight against what Donald Makedo uh, uh, talked about, which is, which is a pedagogy of lies. P 
Pedagogy of Lies explains what schools do, and that is to promote a pedagogy that propagates the inability to think critically. Um, this is a time when windows are open for, 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 the, for the policies that we're talking about here, Africanization, decolonization, and indigenization. John Kingdon says though that these windows don't open for a long time. That is why one would be very concerned when they see that there they might be this creeping uh, fatigue because it, it might, the windows now might close and people might start, you know, wanting to discuss other things rather than looking at the current agenda. That is why it is very important that we should act whilst the windows, the policy windows are still open. Schools need education that would oppose racism, ignorance, and epistemic hegemony. Africanizing and decolonizing education is to avoid education that alienates and dislocates from reality. Decades after freedom in South Africa, many still worry about the miseducation of all children. Decolonization will not happen without a huge necessary disruption. Without this disruption, we'll always find ourselves where we have been over the years. The problem we have today in stalling education transformation is created by the fact that we are not ready to confront the meaningful overhaul of education as well as revolutionary consciousness. Revolutionary consciousness is linked to critical consciousness that people, as Paulo Freire espoused, that people should look at education as liberating. Education needs to challenge the status quo and enable people to take charge of their lives. The call for a decolonized education is to challenge the status quo as the way we teach children in, is gradually transformed. Education should be conscious raising in the context of decolonization both the teacher and the learner should understand the role of African values in the process. Thank you so much, colleagues. That is the end of my presentation. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Thanks, we really, really, you know, appreciate your presentation. It raises a lot of uh, really pertinent issues. Um, before we open up for, for questions, I just want to touch on some of the points that you raised. And in fact, I'll, I'll sort of pose questions, uh, you know, as I do. Uh, the first one is, you know, my wife and I decided uh, last year to register for postgraduate certificates in education. So she does has, in fact, she's on this call. Uh, she decided to do has at WITS because she's at Chancellor of WITS University. And I decided to do mine at uh, UNISA. Uh, my surprise and shock was how initial teacher education, and you've talked about teaching practice and what teachers get taught. I think, you know, UNISA has tried to move the curriculum and decolonize and Africanize it. But even there, there's still many, many aspects that are based on very colonial theories of learning and teaching. Uh, you mentioned some of the scholars, you know, that uh, you, you, like Paula Freire or Pierre or, you know, Vygotsky and a lot of others that are theories that were developed mainly in Europe more than 100 years ago, a lot of them. And they still are initial in the initial teacher education curriculum. And that's what, and you find very, very little. I had to go and find, for instance, I read a lot of your work. Um, there's very little which is referenced to African scholars, thinkers around learning and teaching and how curriculum and some of the topics that you've covered today. And when we compare notes with uh, Judy, my wife, at it's, it, it's the same, you know, there's very little. So things have not changed. Uh, so that's the first thing. And maybe just, you know, your thoughts around how change, understanding that change is difficult mm. and, and, mm. and how that change can be driven. The second one is around the issue that you raised around language. Um, and I'll tell a very quick story. So 
I'm involved in, with a business and we're you know, doing a pitch at Stellenbosch University for providing online learning. And we were shown the door because our pitch was done in English and not in Afrikaans. And as we know in this country, Afrikaans is a commercial language, is an academic language, and not just a language that you use in classrooms where Afrikaans is taught. And that encourages people to go and learn Afrikaans. We've, we've had a lot of situations in our own schools, at Future Nation schools, where initially when we started, we said we will not offer Afrikaans. Uh, parents were up in arms because they said, well, you know, Afrikaans puts bread on the table. Zulu, Setswana, Chivanda, and all our indigenous languages do not put bread on the table. The second issue when it comes to language, especially in this country, is that the language of learning and teaching, according to the constitution, it recognizes that indigenous languages can be used, but they're only used in the foundation phase. In other words, grade one, two, and three. And there's a very abrupt switch at grade four, the intermediate phase, where the language of learning and teaching across all subjects is English. Yes, you may do uh, a first additional language or an additional language in one of the indigenous languages, but the language of learning and teaching switches to English. And the problem with that is that 80% of the teachers that are in our system, you know, 25,000 schools, are not first language English speakers themselves. The resources and the transition is not very well managed because indigenous languages that are used in the foundation phase are hardly invested in. I mean, if you look at the underinvestment in the Pan-African Language Board, as an example, it's just an indication that there isn't even political will to invest properly in our indigenous languages. And the Department of Basic Education has had a strategy for years now for the incremental introduction of indigenous languages even as languages of learning and teaching in certain subjects, but it hasn't happened yet. It, there was a bit of noise when the students were protesting around decolonization, but that whole progress, that whole project has died. So I'm just saying, and this has a huge impact on learning attainment, on uh, how our students actually even read for meaning, because if the foundations of their indigenous languages are weak as they are because there's hardly any material in indigenous languages in the foundation phase. It means that by the time they transition at grade three, uh, they don't have the proper grasp of their own languages and suddenly they are learning in English, which the teachers and themselves may not even understand. Like in my own class, I teach grade 10, 11 and 12. I may spend about 20% of the time very often explaining concepts in English because students, they're not, not that the students, I mean, the students are really smart, but they may not understand concepts in English. And I'm, I've got to, you know, to make them accessible, I will explain them in English. And that means that our lesson takes a lot of time just explaining concepts that if we had understood or the students had understood them, we would be moving along in the curriculum coverage a lot, a lot faster. So just your thoughts, I mean, there seems to be, there's a huge issue around how we manage this issue of language. It has a huge impact on learner attainment and reading for meaning in our country, let alone the fact that we don't even invest. I mean, when you try and find learning and teaching material or even any content for that matter in Chivanda or Sepedi, you hardly ever find it. There may be some in, in Zulu or Sikosa and you know, Sesotho, uh, but there's hardly anything. And, and it, it really talks to this issue, which has been exposed by COVID, that parents had to play a role in the learning and teaching of their children because of COVID. But what actually happens is that parents are completely excluded and disintermediated because the language that's spoken at home is not the language that is used at school, especially from grade four onwards. So essentially you're saying to parents, you know, they don't really, matter, they can't get involved, especially if they're not proficient in the language of learning and teaching, which is obviously English from grade four. So just your thoughts on that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Masana. A very, very uh, good comments. Uh, it's such a mouthful. Uh, looking at the first one, what teachers get taught. Uh, 
sadly, this seems to be the picture when you look all over that we are, we may be blamed as institutions of higher learning, that we are not using relevant materials. You see, I see two extremes here whenever I look at universities. You take material and uh, a colleague would tell you that we have, we have uh, uh, transformed our learning materials. And when you look, you know, just at the bibliography, at the reference list at the end, you'll find that Nothing shows that, you know, African scholars, African intellectuals have been used, you know, there's just nothing. And then this tells, this tells me that we have, they have not really looked into the African scholars that they should be looking at. Um, the other extreme is looking at the bibliography again, because that's where I normally start. You'll find that there are all these African scholars, Mazrui, Mudimbe, Achebe, Ngugi, and so on and so on. But when you look at the actual content, it's still the same old wine. That is, that is, what, is the, what usually happens. And this is what needs to, to, to really change. Because we cannot go anywhere. As I've said earlier, when I was uh, reading my notes, if teachers are not prepared for the actual changes that we envisage, it will be difficult to move forward. It will really be very difficult. So that's where it should start, that teacher education, teachers should be, they should know, they should be conscious of what needs to be taught in their classrooms, what they need to discuss with their learners. You know, otherwise really we'll be killing the purpose of, of, of what we are trying to do. That is my first one. So looking at the language one, this one again, it is, it is, it is a, a, a very contentious one. Um, some people have even started talking about using English for our purposes as Africans, meaning changing it and, 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 and ap appropriating it to do what it's supposed to do in Africa. Uh, again, Ali Mazrui talks about, talk, well, he, he, he uses terms like interpenetration and counterpenetration when he talks about using English, changing it and ensuring that it serves the purposes of, 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 of the Africans. But it should go deeper than this because language is, is, is really critical. You are talking about, about learners who in your classes struggle. You have to first to, to explain the concepts before they really understand what you are teaching. So it is very critical that we should not look away from, from the language uh, issue. Unfortunately, I think there are a lot of challenges even with policymakers. Because at some point, um, this is about five years ago, four years ago, there was the, 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 that we are going to introduce Mandarin as the third or fourth language. And then two years down the line, we heard that Kiswahili will be introduced. So you, you can see that this shows the, 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 the challenges. We, we are really not sure how to approach this, but it is very critical that we also start there. As I've quoted Diop that he says, there's no African Renaissance that we can be able to achieve without really starting with languages. You are talking using a very useful concept there, investing in languages. Are we doing it? I would say not enough as government. And this is where really we should be really be looking at. Because what you were talking about is what Macedo calls stupidification of students, stupidification of learners. Because you are in this classroom, you are sharp, but you cannot hear, you cannot understand because the English language speaks beyond your understanding. And some people might think you, 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 you don't understand, you are stupid. But really it's, 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 it's about language itself. It makes you 
to look stupid, hence stupidification, what language does. You know, an idea, a point that Nico raises also, where he was saying that at universities, you'll find that students, they are silent, they are inward looking. Instead of speaking in class, they look at their white counterparts and they find that they express themselves so well. So they decide to keep quiet. You know, again, this idea of stupidification. So that is why it is important that for us to move further with this decolonization and Africanization, we should really be able to look at this language uh, factor. Otherwise, we would fail in, in, in achieving many of what we want to, to, to achieve. The languages are, are critical. They are critical, really pivotal in what we want to do. Because um, I remember who's this philosopher, his name is just, it's not we really do, but there's this philosopher who, say, who says, even when we use, as black philosophers, when we use philosophy that is written in English, he says, we are missing a lot. Because when we think, we think, we try to think in English. And we try to write what we think is our philosophy. And yet, what the language does, what the English language does, it changes our thinking in such a way that you do not really think as a philosopher the, the way you should be thinking. You know, because this is modeled by the language factor, because you are not thinking as you should be thinking. You are trying to think in another language. Thank you. Thanks very much, Prof. Uh, we, we're going to take just a few questions. So, um, Tolo, you're going to, you know, facilitate the Q&A question. Uh, we, sure. you know, appreciate that we run a little bit of over time. So we'll keep the questions very brief. In other words, we uh, see there are a lot of comments and questions. Unfortunately, yeah. we can't deal with all of them because uh, we run out, out of time. And maybe just can just comment on the presentation, the fact that we're going to make it available. Uh, thanks to look over to you. All right, sure. Um, so yes, ladies and gentlemen, the presentation and the recording will be made available on the Future Nations website. So if you did come in late or you'd like to rewatch it, um, it will be made available. So please do check the website next week, Monday. Um, so just a few questions, Prof, just as we um, wrap up, as Ms. Nasana said, there are a lot of questions, so we won't be dealing with all of them. So I think I'd like to start with, with one that seems to be very, uh, let's, let's call it grounded. Um, so the first question is, how do you practically decolonize subjects like maths and science? What does that practically look like? And that comes from Jazz Jamison. So maybe a comment on that, Prof? That is a question that comes out all the time. Um, in, my, in my latest book, which came out late last year, that I edited, there are quite a few chapters. One talks of of Africanizing and decolonizing uh, uh, mathematics, where these writers take us through how we use what happens in communities and apply it in the classrooms to make, to make uh, mathematics easy. They use a term which is ethnomathematics. Um, some people have a lot of problems with the term, but they use that term to show that we can be able to ensure that mathematics is relevant to, 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 to the lives of the learners. For instance, it gives an example, they, they give an example of, um, just a simple example of, of Ndebele art, where they say they, they can, there's a lot of use. In fact, they give examples of how they have tried this in their classrooms in a very successful way. You know, using that when they teaching uh, quadrangles, triangles, uh, theorems. Pythagoras, Pythagoras theorem, you know. But yes. Very useful examples in the book, Prof. Oh, yes, yes, yes. All, all those, they are part of that. So they show these examples. Um, uh, if you look, for instance, at, 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 at a subject like economics or, or even accountancy, you look at 
how, what this means to the lives of the people you live with, you know, and how do you apply it to the people who have, from their day-to-day -day living, they have to, they, they need to use these, these numbers and so on. So many of these examples would come from the environment of the learners. So that is how, how many would be uh, applying some of these. I, I know some people who, 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 who have always been saying that there's no way uh, X plus Y is equal to uh, whatever X2. There's no way you can change it. There's no way you can Africanize it. I, I, I understand that argument, but in reality, it's about really applying these mathematics rules, these, the theorems you are studying, whether it's in calculus, whether it's in trigonometry or algebra and so on. You look at, they look at, at, at their environment and how, what, 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 what is it that when they look at their environment, what is it that they recognize that reminds me of mathematics? So this is what the learners need to do as co-creators of this knowledge we are talking about. They need to be able to come to class to say that, I know I've seen this, this is how it is, and so on and so on. So there are, there are all these ways, as I say, the writers in, in, in the book I've edited, they give quite a, a lot of examples of how these can be Africanized and decolonized. Sure, and I think just maybe to, um, to build on just a conversation around contextualizing education, there comes a question from Tutum Kari earlier on in the evening, and her question is, how do we, or rather how can we use indigenous knowledge systems to combat the dire state of reading in the country, specifically in the foundation phase? Any thoughts on that, Prof? Wow, that is that is that is very critical, actually. In fact, I've done quite a few journal articles on that, not I think about four. Where I look at and then again, parents come in and significant others, because when I talk about parents, I also talk about significant others that the, the child lives with. The significant others, they play a very critical role to promote reading. So they need to be part of the, because, you know, it's a pity that many of our learners, they do not come from, from, from supportive uh, environments. For different reasons. You cannot expect a dad who arrives at half past 10 and is going to wake up at four again the following day to, to, to help. Probably some mama is not there. They are working, they only come during during weekends and so on. There are, there are various uh, uh, problems, there are various challenges that parents... Uh, but reading really needs the support of significant others. And if you look at how, even last year, how we are, we are faring around the world, we are really rating down there when you look at literacy and numeracy. We are really down, down there. I think uh, we are three, third from, from, the, from the bottom when you look at, at mathematics and the, the, the skills, the literacy, uh, sorry, uh, numeracy. And literacy too, we are very down there because you'll find that they say there would be learners who are in grade 11, but their reading capability is that of a learner who is in grade five. That is a dire situation. So that is why reading needs really to be supported right from the beginning. And it's not only the teacher, because the mistake that we normally do is to look at, at the school only, at the teacher only. But there are many things that affect, you know, the, the, the reading capabilities of learners. And hence, we need to really include a number of parties as possible when we want to improve the, 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 the the reading uh, abilities of, 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 of our learners. And uh, why this is important is that if you look at research again, you'll find that our learners are not doing quite well in, 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 in the grade 12 examination because sometimes they struggle to interpret the questions. This comes to reading again. So that is why earlier I talked about in integrative curriculum where you don't see, you don't become a disciplinarian, meaning looking at your own, that I'm teaching maths, nothing else. I'm teaching physical science, nothing else. 
physical science must, must imply history, must imply reading, meaning language, it must, you know, and many other things. That is how we should see this because you want to move as a teacher, teaching in English and having uh, teaching life science, finding that my learners are not understanding anything because they do not understand the language. Then that's where you find that you also now need, Mr. Nasana said earlier that he finds himself having to explain first, uh, wait, uh, wasting more time to explain so that the learners understand before really going back to teach uh, in English as he should be teaching. Sure, thank you for that. Thank you very much for that, Professor. Um, and I think just the last question, just to sort of land the plane of, of you know, the ideas that have come up this evening. This question comes from Sominath. Um, what conversations can we be having about curriculum review within basic education to ensure that these ideas and these ideas being what emanated from this evening find their expression in the CAPS curriculum? You know, again, that's a very critical question. Um, but everything is out there. All we need now is a wheel the will to change, uh -huh. the, the will to ensure that we're able to move forward. There are thousands of journal articles out there. Um, there are a number of, of, of progressive teachers who are teaching as we should. There are a number of things that can be done where we can look and model whatever right, the, 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 the practice that we think is progressive. But we are, we are not doing that. Sometimes as teachers, for instance, if you look at teachers first, you'll find that we are so used to alienate ourselves, get into your classroom, close that door and do whatever you, 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 you want to do without sharing. I think it should start there. How do we have this wheel of starting this and, and moving forward so that we inject this new life that we want in our curricula? It, it is important and it needs you know, people who, intellectuals who will say that we, we are going to move forward. And intellectuals, I, I'm talking about teachers, I'm talking about anybody who works within education to lead and, 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 and take this further. Because sometimes we, 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 this ends in, you know, uh, uh, usually when I visit the library, I look at all the theses on the shelves. And I always wonder whoever comes and read these good findings, excellent findings, you know, and you'll find that most probably one thesis that passed in 10 years ago, maybe it was read twice. You know, that is, that is very sad because in some of these you'll find that there are, there are recommendations, suggestions that are very good that can be applied to change our state of education, but it never happens. That is why it needs, it really needs soldiers who take this and move forward to lead. That, that, that is really what we need. And working of course with the, with the department of education, um, of course, we also depend upon their programs. Uh, will they be able to really give, give room to people coming from outside to share these outside, to share these ideas. Uh, that, that all of these are, are very important and usually they need to, they need one to, to knock on doors and, and you know, come with proposals. This is what I want to do, is it possible and so on. So, but yeah, it is, it is very important that conversation should really spread and all over, we should have these conversations to make sure that this is, the, 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 the baton is moved forward um, so that the fire burns throughout and people understand what needs to be done as we are trying to change, transform the education system. Sure. Well, let no, me uh, take this opportunity. Uh, yeah, I know, uh, Tulu, uh, I think we're going to uh, wrap it up. Um, and uh, let me take this opportunity to thank uh, Professor Msila uh, immensely for your, for your contribution, uh, your thoughtfulness, the suggestions uh, that you've made, but also thank all our attendees, uh, you know, who've taken the time to uh, attend this evening. 
uh, you know, at Future Nation Schools, we're doing some of the things that you mentioned. Uh, multidisciplinary teaching is something that we introduced when we started, we continue with it. And it's quite amazing. Obviously, it requires a lot of retraining of our teachers, um, you know, because they've got to you know, understand that in your class that there could be two or three other teachers and you have to plan together uh, to be able to teach a topic or a theme and so on. And, and there's a lot of investment that goes into doing that at the beginning of each year or even at the beginning of each term as we go through the planning. Uh, but the results are amazing because not only are you able to deal with issues like communication and language, but also you are able to connect the dots in knowledge in curricula so that you know, students understand. So in my accounting class, as an example, I could have you know, a teacher, a mathematics teacher, because there are a lot of mathematics concepts that are, are found in accounting. And if we teach them in silos, you know, students don't actually make the connections of the dots. Whereas if you do, suddenly you find that uh, the level of understanding uh, and deep knowledge of that topic improves quite immensely. And, and secondly, you know, this co-creation of knowledge, you know, we do project-based learning and inquiry-based learning. And it's amazing what happens when teachers and students work together every day on inquiry and projects, whether they're mini projects or longer term mm -hmm. projects and so on. And, and it enriches the amount of knowledge as well as the student and the teacher understanding of the learning process, of the knowledge process, of the competencies that then result from all of this. Uh, so let me just take this opportunity to thank you uh, immensely for your contribution and thank all our attendees uh, for you know, joining us. Uh, this is going to be an ongoing discussion and I'm glad that there are people, for instance, from the National Education Collaboration Trust, uh, which works with the Department of Basic Education. There are others as well who are on this call because uh, not only do we need to continue having a conversation on these topics, we need to find solutions around them. Uh, and implement them in the system, especially because you know the department often is really just dealing with day-to-day -day issues, fighting fires, you know, making sure that curriculum coverage happens and that teachers are where they're supposed to be and so on. And very often there is limited space, you know, in government to discuss these issues, but even more so to find solutions and implemented implementable programs uh, to actually do it. So, so thanks very much for your insights. And thanks very much for your contribution. And thanks for all the comments and the questions that uh, we have seen. We'll certainly, you know, as Tula has indicated, make the presentation available uh, on our website. And uh, yes, uh, please uh, watch out for further future talks that we're going to be having on some very topical issues. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Glasada. Have a good night. Have a good night, too. Thanks. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Have a good evening.